a lot better than work there. I mean, it's brilliant. I've been around the world. I've been ever so lucky. Um, I do consider I've been ever so lucky to do something I enjoy. And that's something I really try to convey to the players. You know, this is, this is, this is the greatest thing that's happening to you in your life. I've known Ron a long time. And I believe that the relationship between chairman and manager must be just like blood brothers. Frankly, that's when you get success. For more than 20 years in a precarious profession, Ron Atkinson has always been a manager in demand. A charismatic character with the knack of bringing out the best in the most talented players. In the 50s, he rejected full-time football at Aston Villa before graduating into the league with Oxford United, a powerful figure on the pitch, a natural leader. He moved from Oxford to Cambridge to management via a non-league apprenticeship. Cambridge climbed spectacularly. In three years at West Bromwich Albion, he built one of the most attractive sides in the land. In five seasons at Old Trafford, he twice won the FA Cup and came so close to the championship that United wanted so badly. His personality perfectly suited to the pressures of a high-profile job. West Bromwich Albion welcomed him back for a time when he left United, then a short and eventful spell in Spain, before the call came from Sheffield Wednesday. Relegation at first, but within a year, the League Cup was won, and then their place amongst prominent clubs regained by promotion. The parting from Hillsborough was painful on both sides. He couldn't resist the attraction of an offer from a club he loves, Aston Villa. Last season was his most successful ever in terms of league placing, Villa finishing runners-up, after signs that the ultimate accolade in domestic management would be his at last. In the end, with some irony, it was Manchester United who took the prize from his grasp. But his appetite for success is undiminished. The only thing you can, the only thing you can demand if people want you is because they think you're not better what you do now. By and large, from Kettering through to here, I'm not done bad where I've been. And, you never know, I still might make a league championship before I'm through. One of football's most flamboyant figures, Ron Atkinson, the boss. Ron, everyone who knows you well knows how much you love football, you're obsessed with it, you've just come in now from a training session where I'm sure you've been the best player in the five sides. But those who don't know you at all think of jewellery and champagne and sunshine breaks. But there you go, you're straight away, you're talking about it. Is that an image that you've cultivated, or...? Not really, it's an image you and your people have cultivated, not me. But you've been happy to go along with it? No, nope. never, never cultivated, never pushed it, never perused it, I've just been what I am. But get very annoyed when people like you, and people in your industry, start bringing that up. Okay. Never gets mentioned that every football team I go to seems to do quite well. We might get on to that. Good lad. <laughs> One thing that's also mentioned and probably might upset you as well, that they always refer to the fact that you were born in Liverpool, but you're really not a scouser. You, you came to the Midlands at quite a young age. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was born there. And, uh, to be fair, um, I suppose I spent most of my life in the Midlands, but uh, I also spent a fair bit of time up on Merseyside, you know, because a lot of my mother's people came from that side, so we were invariably, when there was breaks, holidays or whatever, we were always up there. Did you watch any of your early football up there or was that in the Midlands? first game I ever saw at Anfield was actually, it was a Liverpool schoolboys match. Liverpool played Derby schoolboys. And I think there was about 50,000 people there. It was the days when uh, Ray Parry was playing for Derby. And um, I think Jimmy, I'm not sure whether Jimmy Mealy might have played for um, Liverpool boys then. Or Bobby Campbell may have done. And affiliations with, um, as a supporter? Um, I suppose, I watched most of my football at Villa Park as a kid. Um, but, you know, we, we'd, we'd always, we'd go down to, like a, an, an on weekend would be, we'd play football in the morning for the school, probably go to Villa Park in the afternoon, um, and then we used to go and watch the Speedway, which was just around the corner from Villa Park. We used to go and watch the Brummies Speedway in the evening. So that was a normal Saturday. Sometimes we'd go and watch Birmingham play, you know, but uh, by and large it was always at Villa Park. And that was in the days of sort of Frank Moss, Danny Blanchflat and people like that. And... It wasn't an easy way for you to get into professional football. You started at Wolves as a, an amateur and then I was had at a... Yeah. I was at Wolves as a kid, what they call the... Um, used to be a uh, ground staff boy in those days. And those, that was in the days when Wolves, along with Man United, were the two best teams in the... Well, certainly in Britain. Um, you know, the days of Billy Wright and people like that. 
and then I left there and came to Villa as a part-time professional. I think that's in, in hindsight, that's probably the biggest, biggest mistake I think I've made or regret in, in the game is that when I was 17, I, I stayed, I served an apprenticeship as a tool maker and I think at the time I should have gone full-time professional footballer, but it was a different world then. But you had the choice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that was the idea. I mean, Aston Villa wanted me to sign on a full-time basis. The idea was for me to basically see my apprenticeship through as a tool maker and then see what was what. And I think then it, it was very difficult. You know, I was training two or three evenings a week, playing in the Central League side at weekends. Um, and that was in the days, to be fair. We would go away with the Central League team at the Villa and you'd have lads, you'd have lads in the side of 24, 25 years of age who hadn't been in the first team. It was amazing, though. I mean, that can't happen today. Um, basically, by the, time, if you, if by the time you're 18 or 19, you haven't broken through, then, you know, you, you moved on. Do you think, having had some experience of life outside football when you were working for BSA, I think it was, that that gave you some ambition, some hunger that's led you to achieve what you've achieved today? It may have done. Um, I mean, quite honestly, when I, when I moved on to Oxford and played, I mean, one of the main reasons, I mean, I loved it at Oxford because... To be fair, something was always happening at the club. You know, we'd come out of the non-league and we'd gone all the way to the second division. We'd had super cup runs, so and it was a super place to live. So something was always happening. And I had a, I had a great job outside of football for about the last five or six years of my playing career. That was in commerce. And, you know, that, that was where I intended to go when I'd finished playing. It gave you some insight into the business aspects of the job you now have. Though. Yeah, I think so. It also gave you an insight into, if you like, dealing with people. I mean, because basically, I mean, you, you look at a lot of players, um, big players, if you like, they finish playing, and the, and the day after sometimes they're asked to go and manage a football club with little or no experience of outside life apart from actual playing. On a topical note, Brian Horton's just gone to manage Manchester City, having served a similar sort of managerial apprentice that you did in your time. What sort of qualities did you have then that he might be looking to show now? Well, uh, you know, I also came through with a good track record. I mean, the clubs I'd been to were Kettering, which was a, a low-down non-league club. When I left, they were the best non-league club in the country. Cambridge United, who were bottom of the fourth division, and then, as I left, they were just on the brink of going into the second in two and two, two and a half seasons. Um, so I'd got, you know, I'd been, I'd had some success at, at, in the lower ranks as a manager. What I think, it, and then I went to West Brom, who had some smashing players. And I, they obviously were looking at me at the time, you know, if you like, a young, untried manager. And that's what some of the players will do with Brian Horton. Um, but I found that players, if you can show them that you know what's what, within a month or two, I found that players were all on my side. And I think if Brian does that at Manchester City, then, um, you know, I think he'll find that the players will respect him if, you know, if he, if he does it right. I think the bigger, a bigger problem he may have is that you know, Manchester is a bigger goldfish bowl than, say, West Brom was at the time. I mean, because they're invariably competing with uh, United. You went into that goldfish bowl. Did you feel naturally at home straight away at Old Trafford? I never felt the, the sort of, what they call, if you like, the pressure that supposedly on the manager at Manchester United. I, I, I mean, I'd seen kids, I'd seen lads the same day as I took the job. Mickey Bullock, who'd been a playing colleague of mine, took the Halifax job. Now, I have to say, I think I know where the most pressure might be. I mean, you know, we had a super training ground, super facilities, money to spend, good people around you. Um, so there is, a kind of, there is a kind of pressure on you, but I still think the lads at Rochdale, at, as I said, Halifax and places like that, have got equally as much pressure, and they, they must look with envy sometimes at, you know, people in the big jobs. But is it a really deep-seated love of football that's taken you from, as you said earlier, you could have gone into commerce when you finished playing, that took you on what is a very precarious road in management for, for anybody, but you seem to have all the way through, Ron Atkinson seemed to be destined for the top. Yeah, love works, you see, outside the game, and I always say this is better than work. It's a lot better than work, this. I mean, it's brilliant. It's a, it's a great way of, um, it's a great way of, oh, right, earning a good living, smashing. I've been around the world, I've been ever so lucky. Um, I was funny enough, I was talking with Terry Venables the other night about this, and he said, well, perhaps it's because you're not bad at what you do. I said, yeah, I understand that, um, naturally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do consider, honestly, I do consider that I've been, I've been ever so lucky to enjoy, to do something I enjoy. 
And that's, that's something I really, really, at times, you try to convey to the players. You know, this, this, is, this is the greatest thing that's happening to you in your life. I mean, we've, we've got good players here. I've been, I've been lucky. I've been associated with good players. And no matter what they do, they'll never do anything better than what they do now. You know, so why not make the most and enjoy it? If you're interested in seeing more than just the goals, if you'd like to debate the options as well as the results, look no further. Because every week, I'll talk tactics and examine the decisive moves of a game with a guest expert. So join me, Andy Gray, in the book room for a real team discussion. Thursday night at 9 on Sky Sports. Talk amongst yourselves. I may be some time. where the haze is, the new haze aroma plug. Shake up your evening meal with savoury rice. Another helping hand from Bachelors. You need strength to protect yourself. So every Mondeo has a rigid steel shell and side impact bars. And you want to be safer. So every Mondale has a steering wheel airbag, seatbelt pretensioners and gravels, and anti-submarine seats. Beauty with inner strength. Mondale from Ford. Saturday night on Sky News, team up with Sportsline for all the day's results. Action from the top events with views from the people who matter, plus a look at the sporting greats of yesteryear. That's Sports Live, Saturday night, 7.30, Sky News. Ron, one great memory I've got about you is when we were working together for television in Spain about a year ago now when England played out there. An ex-player came up and said how disappointed he was his career was over and he hadn't had the opportunity to work for you. What is it about you as a manager that makes players, particularly big-time players, want to play for you? <laughs> I wonder whether the players have actually, yeah, a lot of players say that, but the, the players have got working for me sometimes, I wonder whether they want to play for me. Okay. No, they do, mostly. Um, and I always, I've always tried to treat players in the way that I would have wanted to have been treated as a player. Which is? Yeah, I think you've got to be fair. You, um, they've got to give you as much as they can. Or, then no, no, not give the manager. I mean, not, you hear that cliche. They either play for the manager or they stop playing for the manager. That should never, ever come into play, you know. What should come into play is they play first and foremost because they're professionals and they should play for, A, their professional pride and B, for the club that employs them. I mean, I think that's the thing. And then, all right, if they've got a manager who they feel they can work with or, or is helpful towards them, that's, that's, that's an added bonus. But when I say that uh, a manager's job's in, under pressure because the players don't want to play for him. That, that drives me up the wall. Because the players should consider themselves lucky to be playing the game. As a player, you're well remembered by Oxford United fans, the tank, they used to call you. But you didn't really play at the highest level. So what is it about you as a manager that's brought such success? I think, it's, I think an awful lot of it is opportunity. I mean, I think Alf Ramsey kept picking other players in the early 60s, so I decided to retire from international football very early. <laughs> That's what I tell everybody, anyway. Um, I think what happens, when you, when you go into management, I mean, I was like, I was captain of the club, and I played with some smashing lads. I was captain of the club when I was sort of 20, I think, 20, 21. And I'll be honest, when I was about 23, I thought I knew everything about football. I really did that. You know, we would, it was in the days when um, we'd all nip off after training into the cafe, and we'd all, I mean, there's a few boys with me now, like Jimmy Barron, Mortelli, and Colin Clark, are on my coaching staff now. And we'd sit down for ages and dis discuss football and whatever, whatever, whatever. 
And even to the extent, I've seen us have an argument and go back in the afternoon and, like, try and work on something that we've been arguing about at lunchtime. So, you know, I thought, I, and I, I was always, I always thought I knew everything. The first six months I went to Kettering, the first, well, less than six months, the first three months, if you like, of management, showed me how little I knew. Because when you're a player, you're basically, all right, you're looking after others, but you're basically thinking about your own particular spot, how you're playing, you know, what your involvement is. All of a sudden, when you're a manager, you've got to look at the whole thing. I mean, I also find, I mean, you, you were my mentor. You were the man that taught me how to say foreign names in television, <laughs> weren't you? But I also find that even doing, like, analysis on, as, a, as a TV commentator, you're forced to think about the game in a, perhaps in a different light to what, what you would normally do. So all those things are helpful. And all I've, all I've tried to do, and hopefully uh, from time to time I've done it okay, is uh, put those things into practice. You did come so close to winning the title at Manchester United. If you had done so, do you think you'd still be the manager there now? No, I doubt it. I doubt it. Because, um, I mean, Alex has gone on record, I mean, just saying that, you know, he, he basically wants, you know, that one, that he's him, he wants to be at Manchester United. I've always, I would have always wanted to, I would always wanted to try abroad. I'd always wanted to go and work abroad. Um, that would have uh, always appealed to me, so I'd always have that at the back of my mind. What I didn't do, um, I mean, what they said was like, you know, after Manchester United, there is no life. Well, I know, I've had a good time if there's no life after Man United. I mean, it's nearly 10 years now and I've had some fun. Well, what was it like in Spain with the President Jesus Gil, who's such a character? Or Mad Max, as I affectionately call him. <laughs> that was good. It's, good. it's brilliant, really. I mean, um, in many ways, and I'm sure people like, like Terry Venables and Howard will say, in many ways, that's, that's easier than and in this country because basically you've got no midweek work to do, you've got no office work to do, you don't really get involved with transfers, so basically you just work with the players and then we drive home, Colin Addison and myself, uh, from the training ground, have a sit by a little roadside bar, a little bottle of beer and some tapas, and that was nice, it was, it was a great way of living. And the people were smashing, people, um, the, the, the support and that were, it was smashing. But, uh, and the president, Mad the Max, the president, was all, the president was all right. Ah, he was good. He was all right, but he surrounded him. I think I upset a few of his, uh, well, I call them the idiots around him. Yeah. Moving on now to Sheffield Wednesday, where most unusually for you, you were relegated. Definitely the worst moment I've ever known in a gamer. Because, I mean, I think prior to that, I think every full season, and every full season since, I don't think I've ever been out of the top eight or something of the, of the first division or Premier League or whatever. Every time I've had a full season, I've always been, you know, usually right up the league. So it was a, that was a new experience, that. Um, the daft thing about it was we, I knew we had a good side. I mean, I, I went to Sheffield, once again, pretty well on the same basis. I'd just come back from Spain, and the, the, the old chairman asked me to go back there for three months. Because I fully intended to go back to Spain the following season. I had one or two offers in the pipeline, so I intended to go back. The old chairman, Bert McGee, asked me to go there and said, you know, they were bottom of the league, can you pull it round? I went there, just on a short-term basis. And I, I have to say, enjoyed it, had a great time. Superb people. As, um, that's as good a time as I've ever had in the game, really. Enjoyed it there, and uh, into the middle of the next season, we started to get some good players around us. Really good players. And... I think it was half a dozen games left. We had to beat Tottenham to go about fourth in the league. We'd come right up the league. We had to beat Tottenham. And I remember Gary Lineker beating them 2-1. Trevor Francis, who'd been the best player on the field, had to come off. And before he reached the other side of the ground, well, he, he dawdled a bit like it, um, Lineker has popped two in. And we get beat in a classic game, 3-2. Still half a dozen games left. And we got, I don't know, 41 points, you know, which were, uh, this was, don't forget, this was in the days of 38 games, 38 game season, I think it was. And we took three more points from the last half a dozen games. And yet the funny old thing was it played ever so well. And it wasn't until that last day, in fact, it wasn't until we came off the pitch, we even thought there was a danger of us going down. And that was one of those things where they say, well, you are too good to go down, and we prove you're not. Um, and that was horrible. It was horrible because, okay, if you'd have seen it coming, you might have prepared yourself for it. But, I mean, even, even going up the tunnel, we still thought we were safe after the game. Uh, but the following year, you know, that was, we put it right. Um, that was a smashing year. I mean, we played some mag magnificent football. How sweet was it beating Manchester United at Wembley? Oh, it was, that was a blinding day. No, no, it was a mad year. 
I mean, that obviously adds something because if anybody beats Man U, because they're you know the the major club, if anybody beats them, then it's I suppose it's sweet. But it, that, that don't bother me all that. You know when they talk, it's like last year they said going for the championship. Does it make it different because it's Man U? I couldn't have cared less if it was Wimbledon that was going for the championship if we could have won it. You did arrive as manager of Aston Villa in controversial circumstances. Would you change the way that you left Hillsborough if you had the chance? Oh, definitely. Yeah, but I mean, that's once again, it, with hindsight, you do an awful lot of things different. I mean, there'd been an approach from, from Aston Villa. We talked about it, and I'd actually put it quietly to my chairman. The chairman. See, what was happening, I was, you know, when I took the job originally at Sheffield, I said that I wasn't, I'd, I'd, I'd moved here, there, and everywhere. I got a place where I wanted to live, and I wasn't going to move anywhere again. I mean, that was the premise when I first went, as I say, first went to Sheffield for three months um, and stayed like, well, well, three years. I could have left the year before when we got relegated. I got offered two or three big jobs, but I felt that was wrong, bearing in mind that we'd just gone down. Like, I, you know, I, but, what, but then when the, I've always wanted as well to be manager of Aston Villa. For some reason, I suppose, going back to the club you support as a kid, and that, I'd always wanted to be manager of the Villa. And the opportunity came up. It had come up before, actually, and through circumstances, I, I, I turned it down. And unfortunately, the timing of it all coincided with Sheffield Wednesday having their first um, civic reception for I don't know how long. And um, by some quirk, the, the news broke. Now, they went very hard on it. I'm left in a situation where I'm just going to get on an open top bus with a cup. And somebody's saying, well, you're not going to be manager here next week. Now, with hindsight, that would have been better left until all that was, um, until all that was completed, like the civic reception and that. That was, that was where it was awkward. And, uh, you know, to be fair, it wasn't half hard holding a cup in your hand and people say they don't go. Kids crying and you say, well. Although I knew that if I'd have, I'd have struggled to have done it, certainly more than a year more at Sheffield. But what I do know, and what, um, that I left them with a good side, some great lads, and, you know, they've gone on from strength to strength since then. You said earlier that you definitely wouldn't have seen your career out at Old Trafford, even if you'd won the title. But what about Aston Villa, your boyhood club? You're obviously very happy here. Is this the final port of call, do you think? It's never so awkward with a chairman like mine, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't honestly know. don't honestly know. I mean, I'm a bit sad Clough is retired because... Uh, Tell I made a mention the other day that I'm now the oldest manager in the league, but uh, what I do feel, I feel, you know, when you're about 40 and you're in management, been in a few years, you think, well, I can't do this much after 45. And I said, I feel less as if I want to retire now than I do when I was, you know, 10 years since or whatever. Ron, I can't let you go without referring back to what was quite an irritable start to the interview. The public will expect me to ask you about your lifestyle and the champagne and the jewellery. You're at it again, aren't you? No, but I just want you to say <laughs> something about, is it the real you, or has it, have, have you just been happy for it to go along? Then? Whatever case that I, I mean, I was fortunate when I went to, with the schools I went to for school dinners, we used to get champagne, and it was good. <laughs> and I know you wanted to be a singer as well. I know. Tank Sinatra, I believe, is what they used to call you at uh, Oxford United. Uh, uh. <laughs> Hey, I tell them the only one that's used Nigel Kennedy is a karaoke machine, isn't it? <laughs> Final question, Ron. You are one of the senior bosses, if not the senior boss. The boss of bosses. Don't tell me that one. <laughs> You've always been in demand. Why? Demand for what? For work. For work. I don't know. I think... The only thing you can, the only thing you've been demand if people want you is because they think you're not better what you do now. By and large, from Kettering through to here, I've not done bad where I've been. And you still, deep, deep down, would love to finish when it's all over with a league championship? Yeah, or anything. I mean, I'll I tell you what, if, if we get a chance of going to Wembley again this year, I'd love it. I mean, people say, oh, not the FA Cup, like, you know, oof, brilliant, marvellous. I mean, I can just imagine, I mean, Aston Villa were all synonymous with FA Cup success. And yet the last time they went to an FA Cup final, I was one of the kids, you know, in the, in the squad travelling. Um, and I can just imagine how the city of Birmingham would react to us going to Wembley, in, a, in an FA Cup final particularly. We'll watch out for that. <laughs>